Um, again, just wanted to acknowledge the National Groundwater Association um, for sponsoring this lectureship. Um, and I certainly feel honored and appreciate having this opportunity. Um, <clears throat> my title is Guidelines for Effective Model Calibration. Um, I want to say that I think I'm rather bold to come around, the, go around the, the world actually and talk about model calibration and specifically outline some guidelines because uh, model calibration is something that anybody who deals with models and data has to figure out some way of coping with. Um, and people tend to develop their own ways of doing things and develop some dearly held beliefs about how to do things. And here I'm waltzing in and presenting a set of guidelines. But to my mind, this isn't to my, the right way to do things, okay? It's a set of ideas that I find useful. I'm hoping that it will be a useful part of the conversation related to how we do uh, model calibration. And obviously that conversation will continue for a long time. Um, also, the next part of the title is any model, and um, the methods I'm going to talk to you about are going to be in the context of groundwater modeling, because that's my expertise. Um, but I think it won't be too hard to see that they're applicable to any situation, any situation in which you're comparing a model to data. And in fact, I taught a course at the University of Colorado about a year ago, and half my students were groundwater people and half of them were surface water people, and there wasn't any problem really with, with relating that, these ideas to their work. But as I said, I'm going to be in the groundwater context, and, the, and some of the um, uh, rationales for why you do certain, use certain tools or do things certain ways are because of how certain problems are set up. So there will be um, specific arguments related to groundwater modeling. And groundwater modeling can be thought of as proceeding in this sequence of steps. You start off with some hydrologic and hydrogeologic data that's related to model input. From that, you build a groundwater model that's characterized by certain parameters, aspects of the system that you have to assign values to. Um, sometimes we have data related to model outputs, which I'm calling dependent variable observations. Um, in in uh, groundwater, that's frequently hydraulic heads, maybe some drawdowns, maybe something about like stream flow, uh, stream flow gains and losses, some kind of flow. We're going to be dealing with spring flows in the example I'll be using. Um, and you might be able to say something about transport. <coughs> and there might be some mismatch between what you've observed in terms of the outputs and what you've simulated. There might be a, you have to go into this process of calibration. And um, uh, once the model's developed, um, generally the goal is to use it to make some kind of prediction, hopefully evaluate prediction uncertainty in some way. Um, and then this analysis goes into making um, what are sometimes very significant societal decisions. Now, what are some of the problems and difficulties with groundwater modeling? First of all, it's often unclear how to relate our field data and field values to the model, okay? And that's pretty much the scale problem. <clears throat> Excuse me. We also have very poor access to our systems. Only a, par a small part of the system is sampled under the best of circumstances. If you compare it, for example, with surface water modeling, in surface water modeling, topographic maps are very important. Now, if you were a surface water modeler and you took your, your, your topographic map and put a piece of paper over it and put a couple of holes in it, and could only see what the slope was there, that's what we get to deal with as groundwater modelers. And we're supposed to say something about where this water goes. OK, with geophysical methods, we're kind of peeling the paper away. It's kind of like looking at the topographic map with very bad glasses. So we still have the problem. Um, but, but you know, there's some progress there. But um, in general, this problem of poor access is going to be pretty pervasive. And in the context of that, we have extreme societal need for detailed answers. We're often dealing with drinking water. Very small concentrations are problematic. Um, and from these characteristics, you can come to several different conclusions, a number of conclusions. But the one I'm going to focus on is that given the data we have, models based on field data alone consistently re represent the real system too poorly when tested to really be useful, to use to do what we want to do. So what that means is when we look at these pieces of the puzzle, this calibration portion of model development is very important and, and highly dependent on in a lot of circumstances. And, um, and yet, the technology we bring to that is often very crude. Certainly when I got involved in groundwater modeling in the 70s, it was extremely crude. And actually, still now, trial and error is the way we develop most of our models. 
Um, so I d really, as a PhD student, decided to work on that box. I am still working on that box 20 years later. Um, um, what I'm going to uh, show you today are some ideas about model calibration, and I'll also show you some specific quantitative ways of relating observations, parameters, and predictions. So that's why those are in red. Okay. <coughs> um, the work that I've done in model calibration, I summer up to 1998, I summarized my thoughts in a USGS document called Method and Guidelines for Effective Model Calibration. It's available on the web, or if you write to me, I can send you a hard copy. Um, and in that, there's a series of methods that are described. Um, to begin with, nonlinear regression is suggested as a way to achieve um, parameter values that produce the best fit to our measured values, basically the observations. And when I got involved, there had um, the, um, nonlinear regression methods were being used with relatively simple groundwater models by people like Dick Cooley, who was at Desert Research Institute for a while, um, and Bill Yeh, who's at UCLA. Um, but um, um, so there was some work done on nonlinear regression. Um, in doing the nonlinear regression, um, there is something called uh, sensitivities that are calculated. Uh, and one thing that hadn't been done is that there was a greater potential in terms of using those than was being taken advantage of, so I did work on that. Um, you can have a set of methods, and if there isn't software to go along with it, people aren't going to use them. So uh, um, the idea wa was to bring that technology into a computer program that had the kind of complexities that people were actually applying to the field. Um, and uh, I, in considering that as a goal, I wanted to use a computer program that was all used. ModFlow was, at that time and still is, the most popular groundwater model in the world. It was also published by my agency, and it was freeware, so that seemed like a logical choice. Um, and I needed to choose a specific model because I wanted to program in very accurate sensitivities and that required a lot of custom programming. ModFlow, when I started it, was 7,000 lines of code. I created something called ModFlow P, which is a precursor to the current ModFlow 2000. ModFlow 2000 was 17,000 lines of code by the time I got done with it. And most of that, and certainly the most painful programming, was the sensitivities. So it's a lot of custom programming to get those accurate sensitivities. And in doing that, the code, it's, you, you're, you've dealt exactly with one code, in this case, a groundwater flow code. Um, and neither I nor anybody else wants to be stuck just considering groundwater flow and with a certain set of assumptions. Um, so it was important to develop something more general. Um, at about the time that actually Dick Yeager from the US Geological Survey brought up the idea of doing something with less accurate sensitivities that was ap more ap generally applicable, um, a, a commercial code came out called PEST um, by a guy named John Doherty from Australia. And um, um, so we thought, oh, we don't need to do that. Well, except PEST didn't print out anything about sensitivities. And um, so uh, Eileen Poter from the Colorado School of Mines and I produced something called U-Code. Um, which, and at this point, PEST now does sensitivity stuff, and the two codes are fairly similar. And actually, there's talk amongst the three of us, Eileen and John and I, to put those together and have one public domain code. PEST is currently commercial, but um, have one, put all our efforts into one code, because all of us mostly just want people to use their models better. Um, so hopefully that's an effort that'll go on the next couple of years. Okay, as I taught, again, as I, as I taught this material to the programs, it was better, but still people were very confused about really how to use these things. Um, and so I uh, produced a set of guidelines, and that's what I'm going to focus on today, is really talking about those. My goals with the guidelines, one was to raise the base level of groundwater model calibration so people even doing their first model could bring more sophisticated methods to the problem. Uh, my intent is for them to perhaps establish a base level from which innovation would occur, okay? The main thing here is I would hope that no set of guidelines would form sort of a glass ceiling that we'd stop there. Now, in our regulatory environment, if these ever got picked up, God knows what would happen. But, but <laughs> you know, this is my goal is for it to raise the base level and for us to keep going because th these problems are difficult and people are going to have ideas on how to approach them in the future. The other thing is to establish a set of standards to make it easier for resource managers, particularly for things like um, display, uh, tests for model fit and sensitivity analysis. Um, um, and to, so if, if there's a set of graphs or analyses that could become standards, um, 
it would just make it easier for the resource managers, the people who fund us, <laughs> to evaluate their different models. So um, um, I know there's been efforts by places like ASCE and um, some other uh, places to establish some standards, and this is along the same lines. I think what's presented here is a little more sophisticated than some of what's done there. Okay, in discussing the guidelines, I'm going to do it in the context of a particular problem, just to add some interest to this. Um, and the examples are going to come from the Death Valley Regional Flow System. And my co-authors on this work are Frank Dagnese, Claudia Font, Claire Tiedemann, and Matt Ely, and we're all from the U.S. Geological Survey, and Keith Turner, who's from Colorado School of Mines and the Delft Technical University. There's a map on the left-hand side. Is that as out of focus as it looks to me? Uh, okay. <laughs> so I felt, sorry about that. I, um, I have no idea. Do is there a place? If somebody wants to try, that's great. Um, <clears throat> um, the Death Valley Regional Flow System extends from about Las Vegas, which is here, to Death Valley, which is here. So that's about 250 or 300 miles, and about the same distance north-south. <clears throat> um, it's of interest for a lot of political reasons. One of them is that the Nevada test site is located here, and um, in particular, there's been um, um, nuclear devices that have been deton detonated beneath the surface of the ground, and there's concern that contamination from those may be in the ground and going places. Um, <clears throat> in addition, Yucca Mountain is located here. Um, and the concern, that's the proposed high-level level nuclear waste repository for the United States. And the concern there is if waste is in place there and if it leaked and if it got to the water table, where would it go and how long would it take to get there? So those are the questions being addressed by this re large regional model. We also have Death Valley, um, so the National Park Service is interested in this area. Um, the area is um, both geologically complex, and it's also very arid, which is what this figure is supposed to describe. Um, and um, <coughs> excuse me, from a geologic perspective, the flat-lying deposits in, in, in the foreground are underlain by unconsolidated. Uh, it, they're unconsolidated. Um, they're juxtaposed fairly abruptly against um, a volcanic cone. There's a lot of volcanics. Uh, one of the biggest co co uh, volcanic complexes in the world is in this area. Um, and then also there's uh, fairly high relief areas um, that tend to be underlain by limestones or clastic material. Um, and so one, th one aspect is this abrupt juxtaposition of different geologic units. Yes? Sorry, is there any way to get some feedback on your mic? I have no idea. I'm usually pretty good at, is it off? Yeah. Okay. Can I take it off? <laughs> oh. Okay, all right? <laughs> okay, good, thanks. Um, <coughs> um, okay, so there's this rapid juxtaposition, there's this abrupt juxtaposition of the geologic materials and that's reflected, too, in the topographic features. Um, and this is a shaded relief map, if you can see it. And, um, um, and the topography varies a good deal in this area. And the underlying water table reflects that. The water table beneath Death Valley uh, is at about 80 meters below sea level. The water table beneath the Spring Mountains is at about 1,200 meters above sea level. So it's a tremendous head loss through the system. Um, and it doesn't occur in a nice linear fashion. It steps down as it goes through these different, this very complicated kind of geologic framework. And clearly, any model that's going to claim to in any way be useful in this system has to um, reflect, has to reproduce that, that variation in hydraulic conductivities and the resulting hydraulic heads that, that uh, are in this system. Okay, um, <coughs> the, um, and the gradients, as I said, it steps down, and so in some areas the gradients are very flat, and in other areas the gradients are in excess of 2%, some places we think as high as 10%. Um, that means that the underlying hydraulic structure has to reflect that. These are the hydraulic conductivity fields in a three-layer model that was published in 1997. Um, 
And this is, um, there's kind of a distortion in these. Um, but <clears throat> the top layer of this model was 500 meters, the second layer were, was 750 meters thick, and the third layer was 1,250 meters thick. And the intent of this model was rep to represent in a gross way the regional and sub-regional flow systems. So that's why it's so few layers. Um, the hydraulic conductivities in the system vary over about eight orders of magnitude. Um, and we used zones of constant value, although you can see that the zones aren't continuous. Wherever you see one particular color, that's all assigned the same hydraulic conductivity. And basically, different kind of rocks were lumped. Um, and um, <coughs> we used this approach because the hydrology and the geology both indicate um, these very sharp contrasts in the system, and it was necessary to reproduce those. Um, so that just gives you, uh, that's all I'm really going to say about the, how the model is structured. We've since gone on and produced a 15 layer version of this model, um, but that just got done last month, so I don't have results from that to show you. Okay, so I'm going to show examples from that system, and these are the um, first you've seen of the actual calibration guidelines. These are, there, there are 14 of the guidelines, and here they're categorized into four pieces. There's uh, seven model development guidelines, three model testing guidelines two guidelines for I call further model development and two for predictions and prediction uncertainty. And the colors that you'll see here will follow those sets of, of uh, guidelines around. There's a couple of characteristics. One is that I don't foresee these as a set of guidelines that people would follow through once. Okay, they, for example, alternative models isn't discuss, aren't discussed until guideline 10, but clearly, even if we can set up individual regression runs to be unique, in general, our model calibration problems are never unique. There's a different way to look at the geology or whatever. Um, so you're usually thinking about it from the beginning. But my thought is you usually go through your, what you think of as your most likely or, or at least pick one alternative model and work it through a certain amount and then go back and consider another one. And so that's why it's structured that way. Okay, the other, some principles involved in developing these is that I wanted to, to try to encourage people to state all of their assumptions cl clearly and state whether um, they're tested, or if they're not tested, just state that this couldn't be tested, and hopefully hypothesize how it could be tested. Um, and also emphasized our graphical displays that are both statistically correct and informative to decision makers. What that means is that they're graphical displays that if, you, if, if someone looks at them who doesn't know any of the equations or statistics behind them, the intuitive reading of it would be the right I interpretation to get or the right message to get. Um, and basically, decision makers aren't going to, um, are, even if they have to understand a normal probability distribution, okay, if, if they, they aren't going to remember that when they look at it. It has to be brought to a more simple form. <clears throat> okay, this is the complete set of calibration guidelines. And what I'm going to do, and you can see the ones on model development and then model testing, additional model development, and then uncertainty and predictions. What I'm going to do is say a few things about most of them, not all of them, and then the ones in bold type, I'll actually show additional slides concerning those. So number one is start simple and add complexity carefully. Um, that's kind of the, the principle of parsimony. And <coughs> excuse me. And um, my thought about that is that when we can test it, that hydrologic and hydrogeologic model we used, information we used to produce models, often is shown not to produce a model that is very accurate. Okay, and if we get a model that's so complex that we're no longer able to test it against our dependent variable data, you know, are we really right? Okay, are we really accurately representing the system? And the thought here is you made us indeed to decide to go to a model that's more complicated than you can support, but you ought to know that you've gone that far, okay? That you've gone into aspects of the system that you can no longer test and it should be clearly stated. Okay, number two, use a broad range of information. Um, in groundwater modeling, my thought on this mostly is that we can probably use geologic information a lot better than we have used it in our models. We can bring in more sophisticated information. A lot of models um, are only supported by, at the best, sort of undergraduate level uh, geology, and that there are aspects that can be brought in uh, more effectively. And in that sense, I think we're in a better position than a lot of geophysicists, those who de deal with a de more deep earth systems, because what what we deal with tends to be fairly shallow, and we have some hope of understanding the geology there. 
Three is be well posed and be comprehensive, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this one. Be well posed means don't spread the observation data too thin, or again, be aware if you've gone beyond it. But also be comprehensive, include as many system aspects as possible. That means don't just try to estimate the hydraulic conductivity field, but also try to estimate parameters related to boundary conditions and recharge and, and other aspects of the system. Now, the be comprehensive part usually is not a problem for people. All they have to do is walk out in the field and see a million things that they'd like to include in their model, okay? But the be well posed part is more difficult um, and really, I think, needs some statistical measures um, to, to try to figure out where we are with that. Um, so I'm going to show you some. The basic problem we're addressing is how well are parameters supported or not by the calibration observations. And again, just so you're aware. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to show examples using some scaled sensitivity measures that I developed, mostly because the equations are very, in, very easy. And as a technical audience, you'll be able to grasp them even in this context of a talk. Um, there's a, um, the weakness of those is that they don't take into account parameter correlations. There are statistics that do that. They're called Cook's D and DF betas. Um, and really, the, the figures would look very similar. Um, but so I'm just going to show you the scaled sensitivities. <clears throat> so we want to figure out, do we have enough information in the observations to be well posed? And we have a couple of, of aspects of our systems, our systems that, that I wanted to account for. One is I wanted uh, measures that were independent of model fit. And that meant that I couldn't use um, standard statistics. <clears throat> um, and the reason I wanted to do this is our execution times are often fairly long. Okay, and standard statisti statistics are developed for linear regression problems um, where you can run them a lot, okay, and, and just, just always look at things after you've converged. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to take, use something that could be used from the beginning for, for programs that took a relatively long time to run. The statistic also needs to be scaled because I need to consider both different types of observations, for example, hydraulic heads and spring flows, which have different units and so on. Um, and also I have parameters that are different. I have hydraulic conductivities, recharge parameters, and so on. Um, so I developed this statistic. It's not unlike statistics that other people have, been, have developed. Um, by far, I'm not the first person to do this. Um, <clears throat> but this is a statistic I call dimensionless scaled sensitivity. Um, the dy dt, uh, y prime is the simulated equivalent of some observation, like hydraulic head or spring flow. Um, I'm taking the derivative with respect to the hydraulic conductivity. That's what we typically call the, the sensitivity. And I'm scaling it. <coughs> First of all, I'm scaling the numerator by multiplying by the square root of the weight. The way the weights are defined, this means that I'm basically dividing by the standard deviation of the measurement error. Okay, so if I have a measured head where I got the elevation off of a topo map, I'm not going to be as worried about being a couple of feet off as, say, a hydraulic head where I've gotten the, the elevation and from, from leveling it. Okay. So what, what that means is that as my measurement becomes less accurate, it's contributing less information, which makes good intuitive sense. Okay, so for, for the, and then for the parameter value, for the denominator of the sensitivity, I'm scaling that by multiplying by the parameter value itself. That has pros and cons. It ends up working very well for hydraulic conductivity and recharge parameters because of how they show up in the groundwater flow differential equation. Um, and for the most part, that's the kind of parameters we have here. It works very poorly for a parameter that, say, um, the, hydraulic, the uh, hydraulic head at a constant head boundary, one that would change value just as you changed your datum, OK? Because then you'd be change, you wouldn't be changing the sensitivity at all. You'd be changing the scaling. And just by increasing the datum by 10,000, I'd be saying my sense it gave me more information, which makes no sense. So, so um, but anyway, it, it, it works well in the situations we're showing here. OK, and this is a plot of dimensionless scaled sensitivities for one particular parameter, this, hydro this K4 parameter, which is the hydraulic conductivity of lower, um, uh, um, uh, less permeable uh, volcanics, some of the less permeable volcanics and clastic rocks in this model. Um, and so here's dimensionless scale sensitivity, values of zero um, mean that there's no information in that observation for this, um, 
<coughs> for this parameter. And any value, whether it be negative or positive, that's different from zero indicates a lot of information. And what's interesting in this particular example, and of course I picked one that had something interesting to say, um, is that <coughs> there are four observations, even though there's, there's, there's 501 hydraulic head observations and then 16 flow observations here, there's four of those observations that are dominating, okay, that are really important when it comes to trying to estimate this parameter. And, um, and so really all you need to know to interpret this is that values different from zero indicate lots of information. You don't necessarily need to know this equation and that's, you know, as I said, I was trying to produce figures that could convey a message to uh, 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 resource managers um, without having to understand equations. Okay. Um, <coughs> So um, that's one measure of importance. Now we also would be interested, it's also interesting to say, to accumulate all the information on a particular parameter to see what the likelihood is of being able to estimate it when we do our regressions. And that's done by accumulating all of these sensitivities for all the different parameters and producing something that uh, we call composite scaled sensitivities. So these are the dimensionless scaled sensitivities we saw before. All I'm doing is squaring them. Um, dividing by n, take, uh, summing them up, dividing by n, and taking the square root. The reason for doing that is that it gives us a scaled, um, um, a scaled version of the diagonal components of the Fisher information matrix, which doesn't have to mean anything to you, but basically what it means is there's a statistical background as to why someone would want to do it this way. So these are the composite scaled sensitivities. Okay, and these are all the parameters. There's 23 parameters in the, actual, in the model that were developed. Um, and there's nine hydraulic conductivity parameters, two vertical anisotropies, four recharge rates, and evapotranspiration. Five parameters related to how the springs are represented in the system, um, and two pumpage parameters. And there's this thing on the end called porosity. Now I have hydraulic head data, and I have spring flow gains and losses. How much information does that give me on porosity? Zero, <laughs> right? Nothing. But porosity is important to transport, and that everything this model is being built for is related to transport. So it's important for us to keep track of what we know about porosity. And at this point, for, based on our, our dependent variable observations, we know nothing. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to follow that around. Can you say what you're summing over in that? I mean, you're doing observations. Of all obs I'm summing over all the observations. Ah, I see Good. Nothing. Good. Anything else? Okay. Um, <coughs> in, this, uh, in this figure, you'll see some gray bars, some, some black bars. The gray bars are for parameters that weren't estimated by regression. The black bars were for parameters that, what did I say that wrong? The gray bars are parameters that were not estimated by regression. The black bars are parameters that were estimated by regression. And by and large, the more sensitive ones were estimated by regression and the less sensitive ones weren't. But there's some exceptions here. So you could talk to me, we could, you could pose some really pretty interesting questions. Well, this recharge zero rate, um, which is, it, that's the, the, the percent of hydraulic, of uh, recharge that infiltrates for those areas where we don't think there's any recharge, okay? Um, and you could say, why didn't you estimate that? And we could talk about that. Or you could say, what, what's, what is it about the system that you didn't estimate this one? And the main point here is that you could ask a question that's relatively sophisticated. It's, it's saying that you know something about how much information I have to estimate these parameters. And the fact that you could even ask that question is really the point here. Um, and that, um, and that this graph is, is conveying a certain amount of information about, about um, the data that's supporting this. Um, the other thing is, the other perspective is that in some sense this graph is reflecting supportable model complexity. The model complexity I can support based on the dependent variable data I have. Here are the heads and spring flows. For example, I have a lot of information on these parameters and this parameter, and that means that I could break, I can probably support breaking those up and producing more detail in the model and still support that with my observations. Um, 